I am well, I am well. I give thanks for these moments in time, opportunities to share and, you know, answer questions. If technology is of today is another thing that has really helped our people with staking our claim because those who had the oral traditions now had um, science confirming a lot of what is being said. So we're really living at this shifting point in society for humanity on a whole. Definitely. And it's really great. I mean, I'm so I'm so blessed and grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you and to even share with others too, because I feel that there is so much that can be shared. There are so many ways that we can possibly even help the community to grow because a lot of persons around me, even friends that I grew up with or know currently, I will say to them, you know, when I started realizing I had this enthusiasm, I said, do you know about the Tainas? And I, I was so shocked when some people said to me, who? And these are people who are in Jamaica, just as I am, and went through the same school and learned about Arawaks or so. And I realized one of the things that I really wanted to ask you too is the, we, we basically were taught about Arawaks and we didn't really hear the, the word Taino or the name Taino being mentioned a lot throughout school and now we're seeing that shift or we're seeing, you know, the word and the, the people tying or being shown or being talked about more. And I wanted to understand a little more of what's the difference if there is a big, big difference between Arawak and Taino a language, but you know, it's best to ask you who would know so much more about this. Okay, well, to, to answer that question, Taino is akin to island Arawak, right? What happened is that you have the mainland Arawaks or Arawak, that go by you know, various pronunciations of that name. And we are descended from them by several hundreds, probably even thousands of years removed. And as a result, uh, unique cultures were created, unique admixtures were created on the islands because there are other waves of people that were on the islands that were Arawakan people before. So to look on it in a simplified way, there are various tribes that are on the Western part, the Ivory Coast of Africa. So you would have the Akan people and you would have other groups, probably, you know, Maasai and other groups that come from different regions in Africa. Now, if a tribe is created or a community is created where these groups have admixture and have different elements of their languages coming together, then chances are there'd be another name for this grouping so they can identify them. So they can say that I come from this community and those who know the history know that our right, community is a mixture of these two. So for example, we heard about Carib or Caribs, which are coming right. from the Kalinia people, which are mainland people. Now, the Caribs are actually Kalinago, and Kalinago are people that have Arawakan ancestry and also Kalina ancestry. So the men would speak a Kalina language and the women would speak an Arawakan language, and you have the Kalinago people that come from them that inhabit the islands. Um, there's a group, strong group of them now in uh, Waitukubuli, which is the indigenous name for Dominica in the Lesser Antilles. Oh. So that is basically what happened. Now the story of how we went from saying Arawak in Jamaica to Taino is that it was already understood that the indigenous people of Jamaica specifically spoke an Arawakan language and the terms were used before to differentiate the mainland Arawaks from the island Arawak. But as things progress, there was confusion because when it went to the education systems and you know educating you, they would leave off the term island. Mm. So there's confusion between 
the mainland Arawakan people and the island Arawakan people are. I don't remember who the person was that had decided to use the, the term Taino. And where that is coming from is a story that on one of the islands that Columbus went to, he had an indigenous person with him. And when they saw the indigenous person on the mainland, the, they said Daka Taino. Daka means I am. And they assumed that Taino was the name of that group of people. But Taino actually means relative. It's coming from Tiao or It Tiao, which is blood or relative. So it is saying, I am like you. So the person on Columbus ship was saying to the person on the shore that I am like you, and we can communicate, etc. And oh. it became a term that was used for the last wave of inhabitants of the Caribbean islands that migrated from the Orinoco River Basin in Venezuela to inhabit the island. So there were people on the islands before. There were, you know, Sibani, some places had Ukayan, um, some most had Igneri, which were referred to as like Saladoid people. Um, archaeology before would have classified people by their pottery style, but today they don't do that anymore. So even that is changing. Now they'll talk about archaic and uh, some might say archaic and ceramic. So those who use pottery and those who didn't use pottery, those who would have dwelled in caves and those who would have built their housing. So a lot is shifting with more information. And to add to the, you know, this knowledge gathering here, um, for clarity, there were even on this island different groups, like I'm saying here now. And it's not to assume that when the the wave that is called Taino came that they had admixed with everyone that was on this island. There were groups that, you know, they, they remained isolated. And, you know, as more information comes forth, we'll find out if they eventually moved somewhere else or there was interbreeding that took place for certain communities, etc. So it is way more complex than you know, was previously thought. And the beauty is that no science can back up archaeology. Archaeology is based on, you know, the remains that they find. They were able to come up with a hypothesis and make some assumptions. The science now can confirm a lot of what the archaeologists found and even ask more questions that later you're going to have to do the research to find out. The thing that is important to us is confirmation that that gene pool exists today. Um, DNA has confirmed that. Before, one of the questions was, when someone does a DNA test and it says Native American, there was always a possibility that they may have ancestry from Central America, South, South America, or North America. It did not confirm that they had Caribbean indigenous ancestry, but know that they found the tooth from a Lokono woman, Taino woman of Bahamas, and that information is now available for people to map their DNA against. One of the technologies that people use our websites is, our services is called GEDmatch, G-E-D-M-A-T-C-H. So they can actually map mm -hmm. their DNA against, and you can now confirm that you have Taino or Island Arawakan, Caribbean indigenous ancestry. And as you know, more information comes forth and there's more samples that they, they collect, then meaning of ancestral DNA, then it will be able to pinpoint and say, all right, this person has DNA that is connected to the indigenous people of Jamaica or indigenous people of Cuba or Kiskea, Dominican Republic, IT or Boricen, et cetera. So we're at an interesting mm -hmm. time in, in human history. A lot of what was written, um, you know, the, the truth is coming out. And I think what that is attested to is the fact that a lot of our people are now um, the academics that are doing the research, that are doing the studies, that are getting the grants and the funding, and can say, this is what people want to know. This is what pe people want to learn about. Because prior, this is not new information. It's just that it, it remained in academic circles. It's not just now that, yeah. you know, there was awareness of this, but it's now more common knowledge. Now the average person can do a podcast or um, stream videos on YouTube and 
stream Zoom to Facebook Live. So this information can get out and people have access. Last year, a lot of the big symposiums were virtual. So now it wasn't just a closed door and you have to depend on what they're writing the report. They have to search for the report. You can click on a link and you can participate and can learn. And then you now can share with others all of the information that came up. That's good. That's true. I mean, and it's so amazing because the more opportunities to share the information and the more it's being shared, then you have more people looking for it. You have more people getting interested, more people starting to find out about their roots and even starting to, you know, without even doing the DNA test, starting to identify themselves as, you know, coming from these set of people. And I think, I think it's really good because a lot of us, I can talk for myself, when, when you think about ancestry, sometimes we, we might feel a little lost or we get confused when it comes to history. And having, having like a background to follow and come down and to see where we're coming from, it gives you, it gives you a different feeling. It gives you a different type of strength. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate seeing that growing in people as well. Yeah, and you know, I have to clarify as well for the listeners that there are two things as it relates to the first people of the Caribbean. There is the indigenous bloodline, which can be traced through genealogy, not just DNA. I want it to be clear that for no, that I know of, for no, federally recognized tribe in the United States or any other is DNA a uh, mode used to confirm connection to a tribe, a nation, or a group, or a community. Now, that might help the individual, but it is not necessarily something that is a prerequisite. To be honest, some First Nations, you know, are not very comfortable with that because yeah, you might have bloodline, but that doesn't mean that you're connected to any of the family names or the lineages that was a part of that community. So it's normally through genealogy. There's normally a, a list. And once you can connect to those, then you know that you're a part of that community. So that's the example overseas. What we're doing here is working on creating that list so that future generations, whether the person on the list identified or not, um, if we have that information, we know that they had indigenous ancestry, then their descendants would be able you know, to make these claims and to join, and to assist in preserving, promoting, etc. Um, so there's the bloodline. And then the next part of it is the heritage, right? Now, heritage is not connected to bloodline. You can be a part of a culture and you can have inherited this heritage by virtue of norms in the community that you live or customs that you may practice. So you come from a community that holds strong Taina retention, then you have Taina heritage because in your community, what you eat would have been you know, indigenous food. The medicines you use would be indigenous medicine. So you are a part of the preservation of these aspects of that. The first people is a part of honoring, which is a big thing now that the land acknowledgement in Canada to remember and cherish the spirits of the first people of these lands. And by some cultural norms, some communities, you know, that allows you to become a part of that nation. So there's a lot of dynamics depending on the community. But I just wanted to be clear that, you know, you have two things you have to bloodline and you have the, the heritage and both are important and both are things that are being focused on now by our community so that that awareness can grow and that we can preserve for future generations i mean we have prophecies that spoke to us this time that we're in now we're in an indigenous way would be necessary we didn't think that it would have come to me this is early you know, they have sustainable development goals for 2030. The world is talking about climate change. They have been flooding. Um, some of the prophecies said that, you know, places that were deserts are going to become 
um, rainforests and places that are rainforests are going to become deserts. And what is going to stop that is the indigenous knowledge and the systems that were used before. Science is now showing that the Amazon rainforest was basically cultivated by the indigenous people that were there. So it is by them practicing agroforestry, planting and living amongst the things there, and you know, that allow the rainforest to be what it is. So it's interesting to see the legacy that we have as custodians mm -hmm. and wisdom keepers of these traditions and sharing that now to create a better future. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, like we just started and I've been learning so much already. It's, it's very diverse, much more than I could have even imagined. I mean, I love that. Like, question, how did you, were you born into this, like, heritage, first of all? Have you always known that you, you know, you're Taino or you're a part of this all? No, I mean... Like most Jamaicans, there was always this narrative of extinction as it relates to indigenous things here. And my family, mm, how to put it? My family moved around a lot, <laughs> put it that way. And in moving around a lot, it's not like there was a specific space where there were a lot of oral traditions and stuff from the community. What would happen is that we set, grew up in St. Andrew. So we'd have relatives that would come from other spaces and other places and share certain things with us. And we'd notice trends, you know, like certain medicines, certain plants. Um, every weekend to this day, my grandmother would get bags full of black mint and search my heart and all of these oh. other herbs we use in our household, you know, our medicine, our bush teas. It's a constant thing in, in our household. And to, to get to the nitty gritty of it, when I realized or learn that there was something different, like, like concrete. Because for myself, I always felt an affinity to Native American culture. You know, I was one of those that was always rooting for the cowboys and all, not the cowboys, the Indians when I was watching the cowboy and Indian films, you know. And when I was a child, you know, they'd buy me the little headdress and the bow and arrow and all of these things. So there was just an affinity and I didn't understand where it came from. Where it made sense is when in 2012, I became an apprentice to a healing tradition that comes from the Andes Mountains of Peru. The practitioner came here. They have Jamaican ancestry and they were working on, you know, creating that link, learning about that part, their paternal ancestry. And took me on as an apprentice and I started to learn more more about South American indigenous ways because you know watching TV when you're watching a cowboy that and that again speaks to the fact that we have language barriers you know like majority of our relative islands speak Spanish in Brazil the Amazonian people speak Portuguese so a lot that we should know and a lot of the similarities and commonalities that we have is not right in our face for us to notice it. You know, how many people, though you don't need a visa to go to Nicaragua, Panama, Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, how many people even think about doing those things with them Jamaican passport? Sure. But those are places that will have relatives, Guyana, Suriname. So I participated in an activity following my apprenticeship and learning about the healing modality and learning about you know, South American perspectives and, and indigenous healing and what they call Aini, is a Quechua word, it's from the Andes, descendants of the Inca. And, and Aini means sacred reciprocity. So I give, so I receive. And I realized I was asked to participate in a intertribal activity, a prayer run to represent the indigenous people of Jamaica because you know, I was connected to indigenous things, but I didn't see myself as an indigenous person of Jamaica. So when I started to train for this activity, the spiritual activity, it was one day out of the blue that my grandmother said that, you know, I remind her of her father with these things that I'm doing. And she said that, you know, 
him used to say him was maroon coolie and how him here used to stay all sort of stuff. And, you know, then she used to tell me how her, his mother came from Cuba and used to say words and teach them words that are not Spanish. Um, they don't know what the words were. And I was saying to myself, oh, you just tell me this now, you know? And she expressed that there, there was a stigma in Jamaica and not just Jamaica, you know? Um, the more I learn, the more I understand it. People didn't want to associate with being indigenous or associate with maroon ancestry either. And I can talk some more about the whole maroon connection, but they didn't want to associate with that. That was just, they were taught that maroons were not good people and they were taught, you know, not to really speak about these things. So she as a child was telling her father not to speak about these things. And, you know, ancestors had things in a way that I was in her space and she was able to say that while I was preparing for this activity so that moving forward, I could claim and honor it as, you know, me honoring my ancestors and not just doing something as out of respect for another group of people. And through that, you know, I had my development connecting with other people that had the same experience from other islands and connecting with other Caribbean indigenous people and being able to grow in my awareness to the level of trying to create spaces here and you know, going through my ceremonies here to become cacique and have our council, etc. Wow, I love that. Like, I mean, the whole transition from your grandmother telling you, it seemed like at the right time she was telling you all that information about your ancestry and just coming down and how your grandfather and, you know, coming back from his mother. So, I mean, you spoke just now about the, sorry if my rooster is out back. <laughs> you spoke just now about the maroon connection. That's something like I'm pretty interested in as well because you know I'm I'm seeing a lot of things that that hint at the connection hint at Tainos or or indigenous people basically being with Maroons or basically procreating there and I'm very curious as to what that connection is so I'd love if you could share okay all right so the the abridged version on that is connection between Africans that were enslaved and the indigenous people is not unique to Jamaica. You know, it happened in Kiskea. It, it happened in Cuba. Um, it happened here. And normally what would happen is that when the, because obviously the ships would bring in cargo, people, animals, everything, to the ports. So when they were escaping, they would escape to the inland, the interior. And the more rugged the terrain and the more forested is the better chances you had of escaping. And majority of the times in those territories, you would have found indigenous people who would have accepted that that is, you know, our way. Now, for the unique story of Jamaica, how it has been shared with me by community is that when Columbus himself came here, one of the things he did was on his second attempt to dock, because everybody knows about discovery, but he tried two times prior. The second attempt to dock, he, our first island was the first place that they released the mastiff dogs, the giant dogs, right? They have a chance you can Google a mastiff, a Spanish mastiff, huge. And, you know, they came on the shores and were attacking our people and a lot fled to the mountains. But even before then, there were those who were aware because there was a connection network with some of the communities. Because as I said to you before, that they had different groups here. Even if they were of one tribal nation or bloodline, etc., you know, you'd have different pockets. So some had some information that the others didn't have at those points in time. So there was a group that went up into the mountains and they were able to stay there because when the Spanish came here, they didn't find much gold. So this is another myth that I'll take this opportunity to 
to just get rid of. The truth is that our indigenous people were not treated as harshly as the others for the main fact that there was not much gold found here. So those stories about people finger get cut off and them have to weigh gold in the Dominican Republic and if they don't find it, there's all of this just and there was not much gold here that was found. So we didn't have all of those harsh treatments. And what happened is when they came here, they wanted to settle here. So it wasn't really protected. This would have been like provision ground for food. So they had pigs that they brought here, they had cows that they brought here, they had horses that they brought here. And some of the first vasqueros, vasqueros is the Spanish term for cowboys, were actually our island's indigenous people. Now, when our ancestors were herding these animals and taking care of them, some would run off into the mountains and not return. In Arawakan languages, we have a way of honoring the spirit of things, the spirit of things or the energy of things. So for example, um, Yukahu, who means spirit, and Yukahu is one of our ascendants. Yuka is our word for cassava. So Yukahu is the spirit of cassava, who is also our provider, all right? Now, Simara or Simara bow is like a great bow, or, or some use the term for, for an arrow. We have other words for bows and arrows. And the term was used for the spirit of the bow or the spirit of the arrow, for those animals that ran off into the mountains and would not come back, meaning they took flight. That is what that meant, right? Now understand that there were no words for these things before. Sometimes myself and my relatives from Kasabi clan, which deals with you know, the, the language resurgence, you'll get things to translate and it is a headache because they're, these are just such foreign concepts, you know, like try. Try, the word try is a foreign concept. We do or we don't. So there, there's no try, so just for an example. So that's, that's what that means, that the Simarabo, which from that word came Simarón, which the Spanish had. And then the English now would come up with the term Maru. So some I've heard have an issue with it because I thought it meant wild animals or wild boars, but you have to also remember that indigenous communities respect the spirits of animals and respect the lessons. So I would say on record that the pigs that were brought, that were domesticated, that ran up into those mountains, adapted to the environment. And even when they came back, they were attacking people. They had grown tusk and they had grown here. And to this day, they're descendants of those animals still in the mountains today in Portland. So I think that is something to be proud of and not something to be ashamed of, but that's all dependent on the perspective that you have. And when you have an understanding of indigenous ways of honoring the spirits of things, then you see that that was praise, that these domesticated animals or that domesticated spirit could end up in the mountain, survive and return with another form of a warrior of Nauda, the, the, the one that can hunt, that is hunting. So from that, the Maroons now, the next part of the story is that when the Spanish released the enslaved, this is what was done when the British came. From a European narrative, especially English speakers, which are the British, the concept is that enslaved refers to people of African ancestry alone. And that at that point in time, all of the indigenous had died, but the indigenous were the enslaved as well as those of African ancestry that the Spanish had brought. Most of which were actually from, in those initial phases, from Europe, not from the continent itself. So, this was the start of the Maru communities. And a lot of this can be confirmed by historians and those who studied the windward Maru, Maru of the Blue Mountains, initially. Um, 
the other part of it is, you know, critical analysis could clarify a lot of these things for us. The reality is that if I told you that I am not feeling well, so you're going to have to have this interview with another councilman, that doesn't automatically mean that I'm deceased. So the fact that they had to get more labor to work because the indigenous was sick did not mean that they had died. So that is also an effort, right? There are records of baptisms and that took place and they stated these people as Indians, indigenous of Jamaica. And there are other records as well that confirm the existence of our people. But carrying it back to the main point is that, yeah, the, the, from Cimarron, a Lokono word came, from Cimarabo came Cimarron, came Maroon, and there were communities up in the mountains prior to Columbus, after Columbus came, um, when the British came and the Spanish released the enslaved, and even after that, because telling the story from you know, a Yami Taino perspective, what happened is that there was a shift in power with the influx of people of African ancestry that went up into the mountains, which that is another story from the time. <laughs> I mean, there is just so much, like so much to learn, so much to know. And one of the things that really touched a point with me is when you said that, you know, the indigenous people, they are, they honor the spirit of energy. They honor, you know, that spirit. There is something that since I was a really little child has always been in me. Um, it's mainly with like plant life trees I would go outside and I would hug the tree and I would just try and just feel people used to think I'm crazy I would go and I'd get some plants having no idea what they were and I'd be out there saying I'm making medicine I'm I mean before I even knew what for example leaf of life was I was just getting a random leaf and trying to grind it up and I say I'm making some medicine and I would do all these things and having grown into an adult my household I mean there's always bush tea. So every time there's somebody sick, I'm going around, I'm looking on the internet, I'm trying to find what works for what. And I mean, there was a time when I had to, growing up under the guidance of my parents, I had to be on medication for all sorts of different things. And being an independent adult now, I have found where it's been like three or four years since I've actually taken medicine and I've been the healthiest I've ever been in my life. And because of that, I feel such a deep connection with plant life. I would go and I would just, I would touch my plants and I would say, thank you. And if I'm going to break something or pick a leaf or something, I'll say, thank you for the healing. And a lot of persons have called me crazy for that. But you just saying that honoring the energy, honoring the spirit, it gives me life because I'm saying I am not crazy. <laughs> So I, I really am learning so much more and even not knowing, you know, not doing any form of genealogy checking, just based on what you said about heritage, I am feeling even closer and, you know, feeling like I need to honor that heritage even more because I feel so, so many things happening naturally with me and what you're talking about, you know, I can relate to some of them. And I read, you know, and you just said this as well, when you started, you started with medicine practices. And I know that a lot of the stuff that we're using today, like bush medicine, bush remedy, it's coming from our indigenous past or heritage. And I'd like to, to hear your take on that or hear more about how, how we still use those today or even some more, you mentioned like search my heart earlier. And so, and, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. I know it feels like we can continue this conversation forever, but you know, I just want to hear some more about that and how we can share that with the world because there are so many persons out there looking now, especially trying to avoid this virus. They want to have a lot of different natural stuff. I, I for one, my family has been using vervain and like ginger and like bitter orange and a lot of other things and we haven't been sick 
with anything and I, I would love to hear you know more about taino and or or medicinal plants well i always lead with search my heart because <laughs> the interesting story of that plant it is endemic to jamaica it's nowhere else in the world so the fact that we use it we must have learned how to use it you know wow. and that again is confirming of that retention. Um, as it goes towards medicines, medicine comes in many forms. So you have the plant medicines, you have the stone medicine, you have the animal medicine. And when I'm talking about that, I mean, what it is that we learn from them, what is it that we garner from them, right? Through observing. Sometimes you don't have to go there and take things, but to observe. You observe the, the mimosa podica that we call prayer plant or a sensitive plant. And how does it protect itself? Closes, it folds when there are things that may attack it. And when else does it close and fold? At night, it closes, it folds to rest. So in that, there's a lesson through simple observation that there are times in our life that we need to go inward and we need to focus on those things that are taking place. Yeah, there's the physical stuff that so many people can speak towards, especially now with a virus going around. But what about the internal stuff? What about your feeling of well-being? How are you coping and managing with the fact that the, there's this semblance of captivity and you don't really feel as free as you used to because there are these restrictions? How do you deal with that? By, you know, the sensitive plan, by going within, by by locking off from those distractions and their lessons in that, their lessons that we gain from the sun, you know, that, that's that anchor in our life that we connected to. The sun is a great provider for the plants, for all of us. And every day, you know, we, in our traditions, we greet the sun. So we try to catch the first rays of the sun. Depending on where you are, there are going to be different times. You may have mountains blocking, clouds blocking, buildings blocking, etc. But the concept is that our teaching is when you get those first rays of sun with it comes wisdom and an understanding that whatever it is that you're worried about or you're struggling with, when the sun rises again, there'll be another chance, an opportunity to start afresh, to start a new. So you don't allow things that happen within 24 hours to bog you down. You know, the sun rises and the sun sets as also symbolic of life and of death. You know, when we have an elder that passed, we, we honor them at sunset. So at sunset, that is when we speak towards them because our traditions teach that, you know, where the sun sets, that's where the ancestors rest. Uh, we call that Kuabe or Saraya, you know, sunset. Karaya, it's appearing. Saraya, it's you know, disappearing or shifting away. So there's medicine in the observations of nature as well, outside of just the things that you can use, you know, topically or in just medicine is in the wisdom that you can garner from observing these things. We recently had, this is dry season, dry season starts from November or really like December 21st, but from November, first on the island, we really have two seasons, dry and rainy. And from December until around May, when rainy season starts, but we've been having a lot of rain in the start of our dry season on island, several parishes. What does that mean? How are the animals reacting to that? That creates an issue because it requires adaptability, but it is still not something new, right? So there are shifts that need to take place. Now they weren't prepared for that, right? The birds that setting up their nests expect it to be dry season, but they're able to be so connected with everything around them, they know that they're gonna have to delay what they're doing so that they can be at the right point in time to reap when the rainy season comes and you have this abundance of fruits. Uh, animals like our coney, which still exists, would be doing similar. They want to ensure that they have the young when they have time of fruits. Uh, the 16th, yesterday, was full moon. We call it Abinaka Kishibu Kati, which means the dancing full moon because a lot of courting rituals taking place like with our crocodile, with our herons, so that they can have their children they're, they're the young offspring at the right time when there's that abundance in nature. Now, likewise, that they could adjust and realign 
we too have this lesson to adjust and realign this pandemic, which is now becoming an epidemic. So it is going down a little, but it's still for us to be mindful and of what is taking place around us. And then carrying it from that external, you know, larger view to the internal, smaller view is for ourselves, plants that help with our respiratory system, practices that help with that is, is the medicines that would be used now. So right now there'd be steaming, you know, you boil some plants, some pot, and you cover your face and you inhale it. Most things that people would use now is like, Albus oil, eucalyptus oil, um, to really clear up your nasal passage and clear up your lungs so that you can breathe properly. Outside of that, you take bitters, like bitter wood, things like that, to help your, your body to strengthen, to help it to push through any bacterial things that may come into your system. And then all of these things, you know, are part of our retention as well. Where bitters are more inclined to African culture roots are more inclined to indigenous American culture, fermented beverages. So these two have a part. So when you're drinking with from the roots man, the sarsaparilla and the cheney, um, those are actually indigenous medicines coming from South America that were brought here as well to propagate the island. And you're aware of our fruits and our vegetables that are indigenous too, you know, a lot of our way to combat ailments and issues is really to eat like an ancestral land. And it doesn't mean, and I, and I use the word diet specifically because yes, it would be good if this were everyone's way of life, but we understand that in today's world, everyone is not growing their own food. So as a result, they have to purchase and the fact that they have to purchase, then economics comes into play and affordability. So that is why I use the word diet, that even if you're not able to maintain that for you know, 365 days, having portions or months at least in your life where you're trying to eat in that way, in that clean way, and that is what it is, clean. It's not about, you know, um, to clarify that, it's not just about eating vegetables but where the vegetables coming from you know and it's not about food shaming at the end of the day affordability we're going through certain things now and these are things that our ancestors went through there's this concept that when columbus and his people came that people were still eating iguana and corn you know they had goats available so they're eating goats and they had pigs available so they're eating pigs and that's why people still know how to hunt them and set traps and all of these things now um, when they didn't have domesticated birds, we'd make calabans and we'd catch wild birds. So all of these things are a part of that adaptability. As I was saying earlier, that, that's how things are in nature. So when things pop up that are against the natural order, there's a shifting that takes place and you have to be aware so that you can adjust with that. So all of that came when you asked about medicine, and hopefully it's beneficial to the listeners. I'm sure it will be because, I mean, learning so much in terms of, you know, even as you said, feeding ourselves, we're feeding our bodies, even if we can't do it for the full year round, it would be good to do it for a few months or Give yourself periods in when you know that you block out this time and you focus on healing your body through the things that you're ingesting, you're observing, as you mentioned, the sensitive plant. I mean, there are so many things that we can learn and I'm sure the listeners will be able to relate to some of the, some of the stuff that you mentioned or all of them even. And I love that, which it leads me to ask, how can listeners, myself even, you know, get more information on, on the Jamaica Hummingbird Tribe or how we can support if we, you know, we choose to, how we can be a part of this because this is us. This is where we are from at the end of the day, even if we don't 
have that that bloodline we still have a lot of, a lot of us eat stuff with cassava a lot of us still are doing the, the fishing and the hunting and we're still using those plants even what you just taught me just now about the search my heart i have a whole plant outside and i didn't even realize that it's it's endemic to jamaica and it's so important it's it's one of the main if i can't think of what i want to make for tea in the morning that's my go-to and I just want to know how we can support, how we can be a part of what is happening now with Taino. All right. Thank you. Well, you know, you mentioned that social media can follow our Instagram at Yamewani, Y-A-M-A-Y-E-G-U-A-N-I on Twitter and on Instagram. And, you know, we have a lot of activities and things that are coming up so the public can be aware of that and can support those activities as well and yeah we, we keep in touch you know we try to share as much as we can through those mediums and in the meanwhile we're working on workshops we're going to have our areto our celebration on may 26 at woodside so there'll be more information about that coming to the public as well mm -hmm. and i know that your medium will also be sharing more information yeah Yes, definitely. Most definitely. I mean, I when I started like looking into Taino heritage, it was just, you know, curiosity. And then the more I find out, even with this conversation, I'm so I'm going to use the term loosely fired up because I feel so interested, so intrigued and even so passionate about it because I feel I feel this strong connection within myself. I feel like there's so much that I can, even if it's just to be a medium to share the information, I know that can in its own way help. And of course, you know, when I publish this YouTube video, I'm going to ensure that I tag the Twitter handles, the, the IG handle, and just so that other persons can get to see more, other persons can reach out and be a part of what I will say is something big. I love this. Yeah. And I just, you know, before I say anything else, I just want to ask, is there anything that you want to share with the listeners? Just, you know, anything that I didn't ask that you'd like to share or even with me? <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that I'll share is our elders. Since this pandemic hit, you know, there's been a lot of focus from our communities, indigenous communities and our elders and our wisdom keepers and preserving their knowledge and the wisdom that they have and their teachings. And what I would recommend to all of the listeners yeah. out there is if possible, yeah. do a simple interview, a bio on your elders. Mm -hmm. gain, gain some info and try to preserve that for future generations. Yeah. I love that. And I think, I think, I feel like this is the first of, of many for me, because I mean, speaking with Erica before it lit me up, no coming here, talking with you, it has given me so much more insight and so much more, you know, just information on a whole that I didn't even think of or can imagine that was possible. And as you say, for the future generation, it's so important. I have two young boys who, if I leave it to social media or history as it is right now, they won't know any of this. And I think it's so important that we get the opportunity to share that and to ensure that the information is there for the future generation. So I just really want to say thank you so much. But before, you know, there are like, if you can give me about four phrases throughout our emails, you've been teaching me some Taino phrases and I am loving it. I am learning so much. And I would like if you can just share a few of them with us here before we go so we can have a little bit of, of that language in our knowledge base. All right. So ha home is thank you. And That's ha -home. Of the, yeah, ha home. And the okay. response to thank you is normally dasika who or dasika ni. Both of them mean the same thing, which is it's my givingness. 
That's my offering. Mm. Asika is the giving, asikani givingness, dasikani, my givingness. So, haho, dasikahu, or dasikani. Dasikani. I love that. One of the things I really love about the language is that it's, you know, like when you mentioned, there is no trying, it's either we do or we don't. Just like this, it's not just a, you're welcome, it's my givingness. It's, it's, there is a lot going on with the language here. It's just, it's very deep. It's not just, you know, a little surface thing. I really love that. So, ha-ho. 